It was one of the biggest events in Dallas history. Coming up next on Prime, the opening of the George W. Bush Presidential Center. We'll go inside the George W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum. Plus, it helped put Dallas on the map back in the 1970s and 80s. The TV show Dallas brought fame to our city. Author Nancy Smith writes about it in her new book. We'll meet her next. Prime starts now. No one will ever forget the moment President George W. Bush spoke to firefighters and rescue workers only a few days after the attack on the World Trade Center on September 11th, 2001. The megaphone he used is now part of the George, Bush, the George W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum. Hi everyone, I am Emily Hargrove and welcome to Prime. We have a very special show today. I am here with John Orrell, the Public Relations Director for the George W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum. He is about to tell us all about the library that is now open here in Dallas. Jo John, thank you so much for being here. Hi, Emily, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. So it's been a big time for you recently. It has, it has. It's been a very whirlwind uh, few days here. Um, uh, just years in the making. This all started on the last day of President Bush's presidency. Uh, he picked who his director was going to be, and that was uh, Alan Lowe, who's now the director of the George W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum. And it's been... Uh, all that time since, four and a half years almost, that just planning and fundraising and constructing and it's just a lot of blood, sweat and tears and a lot of emotion and, and finally we've been able to open this up and, and give the American public their, their 13th Presidential Library and Museum. And it has been met with huge applause, hasn't it? I mean, people have just, just seem to love it. it that's been, that's been the, 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 big, the big push, I mean, what I've really enjoyed is I love, I love seeing folks from both sides of the aisle. I've been pulled aside several times and say, hey, you know what? I wasn't the biggest supporter. Um, I still don't support some of the decisions, but I learned something. I learned something new, and I feel a little, a little change coming here. And that's what we want. We, we're not trying to tell people what their feelings should be. We're just trying to help educate them a little bit more on the history of his eight years in office. And that's the whole point of the presidential libraries is just to highlight the histories. Correct. As you say, it's not, it's, it isn't political. It is for every, just to lay out everything that, that, as you say, you know, took place and, and for people to form their own opinions when they walk through. Correct. You know, we are the purveyors of history. Uh, we are here to bring history to the American people, to the people of the world. We're here to bring history to their fingertips, so yeah. that's what we do. And it's right here in Dallas, Texas. Yes, ma'am. So how does I, how does, how does this even come about? I mean, as you say, blood, sweat, and tears, and four years in the making. But you know, I mean, when you sit down and say, "Okay, we're, we're going to create this library," I mean, all the, everything that has to go into it, the artifacts, the emails. I mean, what goes into forming, you know, what is now standing today? Well, it's it's almost a two-step process at first. Um, there's the foundation, uh, there's the formation of a foundation, and um, the foundation is responsible for not only the fundraising and construction of the building, they're also responsible for carrying on the president's initiatives post-presidency. Um, and then the National Archives also gets involved because during a president's term in office, whether it be four years, eight years, uh, whatever, um, there is somebody there in the office of the White House that is collecting. Uh, you know, you show the video of 9-11 there on the yeah. rubble, that bullhorn. Um, if there hadn't been somebody there who had the foresight to hold on to that, we would have never had that. There was somebody standing there at that moment when he made that speech, that impromptu speech, and he mm -hmm. came down off the rubble. Somebody had the foresight to go, Mr. President, may I please have that? And then they held on to it. Right. And that's how we are able to get a lot of our artifacts. Uh, there's one, one artifact in the library that, um, to me, I find it personally touching. It's the Howard badge. Uh, officer George Howard it was a Port Authority police officer on his day off, ran down to the towers, was killed, 
during 9-11, his mother presented President Bush with her son's badge. President Bush kept that on his person Did until he? two weeks before we opened. Did he really? And he really? finally handed that over to us and said, I want this to be part, I want this to be here for America, for the American people, for their presidential library. And so it's now a, a permanent artifact inside of our museum. And that's how we were able to, to gain all those emails and, and artifacts. You know, we have over 40,000 artifacts. We, we're not displaying all of them right now. They'll rotate through throughout the lifetime of this museum. Uh, 80 terabytes, 80 terabytes of digital information. That's amazing. That is amazing. 200,000 emails, something? 200,000 emails, averaging five pages a piece. So we're talking about one billion pages of emails. So has, has, I mean, has the team at the museum been through every one of those emails? <laughs> uh, no, I will tell you right now that for every page of paper and digital information, it will take generations. <laughs> <laughs> you and I will no longer be here, and they will still be working on getting through those papers. Well, the people that do go through the papers, do they have to be security cleared? Yes, they do. They go through a clearance, and it's a very detailed clearance. Um, when a paper, when any document is about to be released, uh, prior to the Freedom of Information Act going into effect, which we can get into more if we need to, but um, they go line by line. They're re redacting anything that has to do with personal identifiable information or PII. Uh, they're getting rid of anything that could be a national security issue. And so they're going line by line for every piece of paper. So just think about this. We've been working on this for four and a half years. And it's been a little bit of slower process going up to the opening. But four and a half years been working on this. And about 200,000 pages are released right now. Wow. So. And so it's just, and so it's a continuous process, as you said. It is, and what'll it's, happen is, five years after a president gets out of office, uh, the Freedom of Information Act kicks in. It'll kick in on January twentieth, two thousand fourteen. Right. That means anybody, anybody can come in there and say, "I'd like to see a document or an email about such and such." Our folks will file the FOIA request. The papers will become cleared. And okay. once they're cleared once, they're cleared forever. So that's kind of the process. They'll be clearing papers on their own schedule, but at the same time, they'll also be handling FOIA requests. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, what a process. It is. Well, we touched upon 9-11 um, earlier, and obviously there's a, as part of the museum, there's, there's a, a good portion of the museum dedicated to that. What has been the, the uh, response from the you know, guests that you've had at the library so far? I've seen mixed emotions. And I, I haven't seen anger yet, but I've seen... Some folks feel a sense of relief. Um, they feel like we have memorialized that day, the, the day of fire, in probably the best way that we possibly could have. And, and then I've seen a lot, of, a lot of anguish, a lot of sadness. It, it, it definitely sparks emotions in people. And we weren't going for shock value when we, de when we developed this museum, but we did want to reiterate the never forget mentality. Right. And I think everybody that goes through this museum, it, it brings 9-11 back to the front of their mind and it really opens up that never forget. And I mean, I never forget on other aspects of his presidency too, in terms of Katrina and the war in Iraq and, and how, how much do you, you know, spend uh, looking at those? We do, we cover, we cover all of the, uh, anything that was happening during his presidency we covered. There is a section for Hurricane Katrina, there is a section for the financial crisis, there is a, a, a section for the, the global war on terrorism, but one of the more unique things that we have, and we have, this is probably unique to any museum, is um, all of those are covered in what we call the Decision Points Theater. Now this is a very polarizing exhibit. It's been uh, highly um, applauded, it's been highly criticized, for, depending on what your, your personal beliefs are. And what we allow you to do is we allow you to step and step in and be the president. We give you four topics to, to choose from: the threat of Saddam Hussein, the financial crisis, Hurricane Katrina, and the surge. Wow! I mean, they, those are those are hot button items during the Bush presidency. So we let you sit down, and there is you get advice from all different angles, all the way from the Congress, CIA, Department of Defense, White House advisors. These are all fictional people but giving real world scenarios. And you'll get an advisor that's uh, for going into Iraq, taking a coalition into Iraq, and then there's an advisor that's against, and they give you the reasons. And then you have to choose how you feel 
according to what the advisors, just like the president would do. How getting all of those advisors, giving you all that advice, and then trying to come to a final decision. And then what happens is, based on what the theater majority is, um, that will be what the theater decision is. And then President Bush comes up and he says, this is the decision that I made. These were the facts that I had. This is why I made it. Well, how interesting, and which I think for many people, they would probably, once they're actually sat in, in his pseudo shoes, that they would be think that, wow, this decision is not, not an easy decision to make. So do they get to make that decision in the Oval Office, in the replica <laughs> of? <laughs> uh, they can if they choose to. Because that, nice, that would be a nice touch. They can. I always, I always joke. I always sit down on the couches whenever the guests are in there and talk to them a little bit. And I always say, why don't you sit in the president's chair over here? And I, I call him Mr. or Ms. President you know, as much it. as possible. But uh, <laughs> that's, that is, uh, that's a fun part of our museum there. Uh, the uh, replicated right. Oval Office. It's not the only fully replicated Oval Office, but it's the, the only replicated Oval Office that people can go into. Oh, they, oh, that's this is theirs. They can go, they can sit down on the furniture, get their photo taken behind the Resolute desk, they can walk around and they can touch the replicated plates and the photos and all the, the foliage that's in the room. And It's the only one of its existence like that. And that that has definitely been one of the favorites. The I can, lines oh, I are can out imagine. the door I can for folks to go I want to go and sit in that chair. Well, we're <laughs> going to be right back to talk about the dedication ceremony, so stay with us. <laughs>